Yeah, right. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? I don't like the summer days. Right. Uh, so we will go ahead. Thank you. So we will go ahead and begin our April 2023 staff Senate meeting, and we will begin with um, calling the roll. Senator Batham will be here shortly. He had another meeting. Uh, Regent Brindley, present. Senator Campbell, I'm here. Senator Candler, present. Senator Cato, Senator Crow. She is the staff leadership institute today. Uh, <laughs> Senator Daniels, present. Senator Gilbert, present. Senator Hopwood, yes, Senator Inglis, present. Senator Johnson, present. Senator Jones, present. Senator Moran. Present. Senator Pritchard. Present. Senator Purdy. Senator Robertson. She is all those staff leadership that isn't she? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Thomas. Present. Senator Vanderpool. Present. Senator Benson. Present. And Senator Waller. Present. Um, Next, we will move uh, to the next agenda item, which is the approval of our agenda for this meeting. Uh, unless there are any objections, I would like to approve that by unanimous consent. Hearing none, we'll consider the agenda to be approved. Next, we'll move on to the approval of the prior monthly meeting minutes. Uh, likewise, I'd like to accept those by unanimous consent. Are there any objections? Hearing none, we'll consider those to be approved. And then I'll mention very quickly and give um, some thanks where it's due. Um, we have a good partnership with uh, Student Government Association, um, and we installed some cameras in this room. They allow us to use the Senate chambers and works very well with uh, Student Government Association uh, to be able to host our meetings here for Staff Senate. Um, that partnership is also now extended um, to Faculty Senate as well. Um, and so one thing, especially if you go back and watch the recording for those that are here or for those that are joining us through YouTube today or Zoom, the sound quality is going to be much better in this room going forward. Um, Senator Gilbert let me know before the meeting they install um, a couple of new microphones in this room and faculty senate will be using these chambers as well. So now all of the Senate representatives, uh, representative bodies, student government association staff and faculty will be hosting meetings in this room. So. Um, wanted to give thanks to faculty senate because they were the ones who helped fund that uh, microphone upgrade. So uh, just so you know, today uh, it will be a little bit different. You can be standing almost anywhere in the room and your voice is going to be heard. Um, you don't have to project as much as you used to. Um, and we just have to go to the podium quite a bit. We'll still go to that for presentations and things. But if you have a question, you're going to be able to be heard very clearly um, on the recording and for those who are watching the live. So next on our agenda, I will turn it over to uh, Senator Vincent for our Christopher Ware Staff Star Awards. Good morning. Um, it is always an honor presenting the Christopher Ware Staff Star Awards. Each month, the Senate gets to recognize individuals from across campus that make a small difference or usually a big difference across campus. There are so many great employees here at WKU. Getting this opportunity to highlight a few each month is just one of the important roles Staff Senate has at the university. If you work with someone or you know of someone that makes that difference and wants to be recognized, you can go to our website and fill out those nominations. Our first staff star to be recognized is Melissa Flowers. Melissa is the academic advisor of special projects. Um, speaking on her behalf is Marissa Bryant. She is the associate director of academic advising. <clears throat> Hello everyone, good morning. Um, Melissa Flowers is truly deserving of this award. She really goes above and beyond to help all of our students. Um, so before students arrive on campus, she's um, answering questions for students. She's helping with top the topper orientation process. Um, so she really, even just before students even get here, she's attending recruitment events and, and talking with students and getting them excited about coming to WKU. Um, once students are here, of course, she takes the time to truly sit down and listen to students. She wants to get to know students. She takes the time to find out what they're interested in, if they're struggling with anything. 
she takes that those extra steps to really connect them with resources on our campus that can help students. So um, it's not uncommon when you're walking around with Melissa heading to a meeting to run into a student that recognizes her and runs up and, and starts talking to her about something that they chatted about in their individual session. So um, it's evident that I can see that she's making a difference to the students that she's working with. Um, she works with our exploratory students that struggle a little bit with knowing what their ne their next step is, what they're doing as far as their long-term career paths and things like that. So she really has a very calming presence and helps those students through that time where they're discovering what they wanna do next. Um, she also helps our student athletes and um, she's a secondary advisor for our Intercultural Student Engagement Center scholars. Um, so she kind of has that part in working with students across campus in many different ways. Um, those that work across campus with Melissa um, in admissions or registrar or wherever, I uh, know that she is a person that you call and that she's always going to be friendly and she is going to answer any questions that they have and she's going to follow up with them. Um, she's just a joy to work with and that way as well if you probably know her or have talked with her on the phone or emailed her about something. Um, she's an integral part of our ACDC team. She takes part in everything that we do either behind the scenes or even um, working with students out front and representing our department in many different ways. So um, we could not do what we do without her and we are so glad she is part of our team. Uh, we tease that she's our banner expert um, because a lot of times if we can get something to work, we're like, oh, ask Melissa. She will get that to work for you. Um, so, you know, she's very knowledgeable and, and she's always willing to share that knowledge with our new um, team members in our department and, and even those of us that have been here for a while know that we can go to her and, and just check in and, and see if she can answer something for us. Um, so she's kind and compassionate, and it shows in all her interactions across campus. And so we are so grateful for you, Melissa. <laughs> Our next staff star award goes to Lindsay Lewis. Lindsay is the director of the LD Brown Agriculture Expo Center. This is what her nominee had to nominator had to say. She is a very hard worker and passionate about WKU as a whole. She never fails to help any of her other farm staff whenever needed. She goes above and beyond here her role at WKU. She also has her bachelor's and master's degrees from WKU. She puts in more hours than expected for her position. She hardly ever takes any time off for herself. Um, also speaking on her behalf is Dr. Paul Woosley, the director of Agriculture Research and Education Center. Well, I want to first uh, thank everyone, especially the, the staff senate, for giving uh, me the opportunity to be able to brag on my staff. I love my staff, and I was grow. I grew up being taught to be humble, but when it comes to my staff, I want to brag on them every chance I get. And um, I I have a love for staff because both my parents retired from WKU and were staff members, and I know that this university cannot work if it's not for the efforts of her staff. And as a faculty member, the staff is what makes me look good. And uh, I'm very happy uh, to have a couple of staff members today being recognized. And of course, the first is, is Lindsay. And when you work at to the Agriculture Research and Education Center, you got to be pretty diversified in your skill set. And so um, Lindsay is a like a lot of my staff and with the Ag Exposition Center, she's a one person show. And so, she may find her in a skid steer uh, um, setting up panels for a livestock show or on a tractor dragging the arena, but you may also find her in the kitchen cooking for an event of feed 300 individuals. She's also my personal IT troubleshooter, which I, <laughs> as I get older, I have more problems with <laughs> IT and I appreciate her efforts with that. Um, but also, 
um, you know, we've got these animals out the farm called cattle, and they seem to only want to get out on the weekends. And because most events at the expo occur on the weekends, Lindsay's our designated cattle wrestler, and so she can round up cattle. <laughs> Uh, rival any person. So if you ever are out and you see some cattle out in the, down the road or something like that, no, don't call in. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's she has a very service attitude, and I try to hire people that do that, and she exemplifies that. And so not only does she do her job well, she's willing to help others, as uh, the nom uh, person nominator mentioned. So. Lindsay, come on up. Our next one to be recognized is actually from the farm. It's um, Christine Dean. Christine is an equine technician at the University Farm. This is from her nominator. Christine goes above and beyond managing the horses and facility at the school farm. She is also co coaches the three WKU Escudine. <clears throat> Squaring, sorry, helps with labs throughout the agriculture department and helps her student workers become better horsemen and students. Also speaking on her behalf is Dr. Lee. Uh, I'd like to share about uh, Krista is that uh, uh, we had uh, a, a time period where we had faculty uh, that retired from from our equine program and and changeover in staff. And so there was a time where our equestrian team um, did not compete period of, of several years. And when uh, Krista was hired as a uh, uh, equine technician, she is an alum and she remembered her time um, here at WKU and participating in on the equestrian team. And it was very important to her uh, to try to revive that um, that team. It was not part of her job responsibilities, but she took it upon herself uh, to do that. And so, uh, you know, this, just this past uh, um, month, we've had a, a couple individuals that's qualified, uh, you know, and been able to compete on a national level. And so you may find her caring for the 40 horses at the university farm, uh, supervising the students that help with that. Uh, but you may also find her in a truck and horse trailer hauling students and horses to Starkville, Mississippi to compete in, in a competition. And like Lindsay, she has to be very diverse. Uh, if you came out last week, you would see her uh, over 30 feet in the air on a lift, changing light bulbs in the indoor riding arena. And so um, again, um, someone with a very service heart and someone I'm quite proud of. Krista, come on. Um, nominating, and I look forward to seeing more nominations. Thank you. Next on our agenda are the guest speakers that we have with us today. Um, so we have Andrea Sherrill, our Assistant Vice President of Human Resources and our Chief Human Resources Officer. Um, and then also representing Strategy Operations and Finance, um, we have um, Assistant Vice President for budget, finance, and analytics, Ronaldo Domine um, will be with us as well. So I'll let Andrew come on up. You're good. <laughs> All 
All right. Good morning, everyone. You'll have to <clears throat> excuse me. As much as I love April and the warm weather, also if you not love the congestion and cough and everything else. So I apologize <clears throat> in advance. I've got some cough drops up here in water in case I need them. <clears throat> However, so in, in even better to know that the new uh, audio will even ampl further amplify my cough. So I does it. Okay, so again, thank you for giving us an opportunity to get in front of you today. Um, we're going to take really the opportunity to reintroduce human resources to you all. Um, since I spoke to you last, I'm in a more permanent position with human resources. Uh, my title and roles have changed over the last few years uh, amidst all the other changes that have taken place. So we're going to take the opportunity to reintroduce you to our staff, what we do, some of the plans we have what we're working on now, plans we have for the future, and kind of what that looks like. Um, we also are going to give you an idea of compensation study. I know several people want an update on that. Uh, Mindy will be able to answer those questions at that time. And then the questions that you submitted um, to Staff Senate, uh, we have included. I've tried to incorporate them throughout the presentation, uh, but I've also tried to, we've, we've had a few slides for those questions at the end too. And then we'll make this available on our website after this for reference if you have to fall off or leave or for those of you viewing elsewhere you can you can find this resource out there as well uh, at the end of that then Ronaldo will join us from a uh, budget finance perspective and share some some insight there as well okay all right so <clears throat> the department of human resources we have nine people currently in our department that perform 11 different hr functions uh, that consist of everything from benefits retirement compensation wellness the list goes on. You can see it there. Um, but those are all the primary functions of our department that we have, again, nine full-time employees performing. We have, uh, we are closing out the search for an HR manager role, uh, which is the role that I essentially vacated, uh, although not really. I still technically have that role uh, ongoing two years now. But we are closing that search out, and we're really excited to move forward with that. It certainly doesn't get us to where we need to be. But there are many things and programs and initiatives that really hinge upon filling that role. It's critical to the work that we do. And the ripple effects of filling that role really impact all of you. So we're really excited. And I hope to be able to share some more news as we uh, finish that search out. So, but, but here you see, we've got Wade Pinkard who leads our wellness and benefits team. There are three FTE on our benefits, retirement, wellness side of the house. They are also responsible for leave management. And then we've got our, what we call our HR operations team that consists of Mindy Compensation, which her role has changed, and I'll talk about that shortly. Joanne Malott, who's our employment specialist, Brittany Wofford, HRS and technology, and then Michaela Daniel, who's involved in a little bit of everything, but you probably are familiar with her either from performance development or supervisory training <laughs> and some of the employee recognition events, especially all the things that are happening this month of April. So that is our team, um, Aaron Heil and Candace Petty. I didn't mention them by name, uh, but they also make up our, our team as well. Aaron Holberman just recently joined as HR coordinator. She is a longtime WK employee. We're happy to have her on our team now. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about, some of the changes, you know, as the workforce changes, so do the expectations that you all have of human resources. And so the changes that we've made over the last year to roll specific to our team reflect some of those changes and that's continuing to change. So, but what we've done is really pulled out the employee relations function. And we have Mindy Hutchin, who was formerly compensation analyst, now is our senior HR analyst with some employee relations uh, functions now under her purview and then Michaela Daniel. And so what is employee relations exactly? So that function uh, is, is really pulling out, we provide consultation services, both managerial, leadership, supervisors, staff, employees, in, on anything in regards to policy interpretation, uh, conflict resolution, um, sometimes, you know, not everything you have to come to HR for requires a complaint. Uh, sometimes you're seeking guidance or direction, and we can provide, we have tools and resources that we can provide. Now, historically, that has really always come from the CHRO, and that is not the best use of time, resources, uh, and really things bottlenecked there as well. So how we've divided those, you know, just when you have a question about how to solve a problem on your team, whether you're a supervisor or an employee, 
we have people that you can reach out to that's not always just me, although I'm certainly an important part of that. Uh, but Mindy Hutchins on the academic side of the house. So if you look at our two organizational charts for WKU, you'll see the academic affairs org chart. So if you are a staff member on that side of the house, then you or supervisor, whoever, whoever you are on that side of the house, then Mindy Hutchins would be your contact for all things employee relations. If you are on the administrative side, so I know we have some facilities people in here, parking and transportation, WKUPD, uh, Michaela Daniel is going to be your contact for employee relations concerns. Now, sometimes I work very closely with them uh, in, in addressing issues and matters, and sometimes they escalate to me. So it could be a, either one of us that you would be working with. But that is how we've done that. We have, we have changed their roles to reflect really the needs of our workforce. And that volume is growing, and we're proud to have their expertise in this regard. So I just wanted to introduce you to their faces. You know their names, and now you, you know what they look like. <clears throat> All right, so I've just got a slide in here quickly. HR support by the number is just to give you an idea of what our day-to-day -day looks like. So Brittany Wofford, if you have ever had the pleasure of working with Brittany, she, one of the many things she does is, is she applies and processes our electric, electronic personal action forms. That is to make any changes to anything, pay, roles, gosh, runs the gamut of things up there in HR. But she processes those and she's processed or applied over 2,100 EPAS in 2022 alone. All those have gone through her. Now that's just the ones that have been applied. That's not the one started, <laughs> started it out or ah, never mind, we don't want to do that or that didn't happen. But 21,000 that have, or 2,100 that have been applied. We had over <clears throat> 350 requests to fill. So those are requisitions, <clears throat> excuse me, within interview exchange. And Joanne Malott coordinates and oversees that process as well. We had, you can kind of see these, some of the other numbers. We had over 5,000 calls to our main line. This does not, uh, in 2022, uh, roughly that comes out to about 20 to 25 calls on average a day, uh, business days. And uh, that does not include calls to our individual ones. So if you have any of our direct lines that will not reflect Reflect, that will not be reflected in that number. We've had over 612 new hires, but this includes both full-time and part-time uh, faculty and staff and GAs in that number. That was a quick number we were able to pull. But if you think about all the ripple act, ripple effects and actions that are required to onboard these people and get them, it's it's significant. So that's so we're really proud. There, that doesn't tell the whole story of all the things that are required to onboard those people. <clears throat> And then on the leave and management, uh, leave management benefit side, we often get a question: How many, how many leaves do you see? Uh, we for FMLA leaves, we had eighty around an average of eighty-five last year, and then paid parental leave, we saw about forty. And then our tuition waiver program for both the dependents and then employees, we saw four hundred forty-two. Now we process those, but a big shout out to Ursar's office. Uh, Heather Talley and, and her team over there that handles those as well. So, uh, but those are just some numbers to give you an idea of the day-to-day -day things that we're handling in addition to the initiatives and programs and other things that we use. <clears throat> on the health and welfare side, so you can kind of see we what we're doing on that side of the house. Again, we have three FTE uh, handling the administration and benefits, and we really have over 26 vendor partner relationships to pull off all of the benefit and income protection, all the vendors that we utilize to offer you benefits. So that's over 26 of, of those partnerships that we manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, this is Wade, Aaron, and Candace that, that handle this. You can see the, the amount of subscribers. So that is subscribers only. That is not necessarily including dependents that are on the plan, uh, but that's, that's total of your medical prescription vision, wellness, and dental. So in the day-to-day -day administration of that, it takes a significant amount of time, but that's, that's, I just wanted you to have some insight in what our day-to-day -day looks like. All right, HR events. So like I said, April is a very, very busy month, but this is the fun stuff. This is the stuff we'd like to do. One of the biggest things we like to do is to recognize our employees. And last night we had our staff excellence awards dinner at the president's house and your colleagues and peers, and many of you work with them, at least know them, and they're recognized here. Jenny Henley, Debbie Gabbard, Melissa Flowers is with us, Brady Fowler, Gary Chandler, and Brad Cornell from Barnes and Noble 
were recognized last night for their contributions and what they do here on campus. And the ripple effects of what they do is could never be measured. But to be recognized by your peers is the ultimate achievement, I believe. And they know the work that you do and they see the work that you do in a different light than maybe anybody else else does. So we were very proud to be able to have this event. It's a nice event. We recognize them. There's a monetary reward, which is also sweetens the deal a little bit too. So we were able to do that. And that event was, was yesterday. And Michaela Daniel uh, was integral to organizing that event. And we're very lucky to have her on our team as well. All right, take her kids to work day. How many of you have kids that are planning on attending this event? Anybody? Okay, we have one. We have one. I, mean, I can't see other hands being raised, but we are excited to bring this back this year. It's been a while since we've been able to do this, both from a capacity and public health emergency, you know, all the things that we were challenged with in preventing us from doing these kind of events. But we're, we're excited to bring it back this year. Um, actually, as of yesterday, the last call email went out and we now have 80 registered as of yesterday's email. So we are thrilled with that number. We have lots of activities and sessions that are offered. We've got a farm activity, uh, game on. I don't know exactly what all of these are, but I've heard them talk about it in planning and it sound, they sound, they sound amazing. So uh, there's still time to register if you haven't already. It closes today. And there's, there's lots of options for if you've got kiddos between second and 12th grade. So we hope to bring that back regularly. So we're excited to do that once again. All right, HR initiatives. <clears throat> so this is something I wanted to talk about. Just, I think it's important for you all to know that as we plan, you know, what we're going to be focused on and what we're doing, what are we looking at? Where are we getting our information from? What are, what's our roadmap? And we really do take themes from your staff, staff satisfaction survey and exit interviews. Those are only two of many, because obviously we want to support both the organization and the employee. We've got a foot and two boats for that. And so HR provides value in leveraging the resources that we have and trying to meet the needs of both. And so when we and your representatives on BEC can tell you, they see the request that we make to BEC in trying to do initiatives and programs and, and have resources, resources to do simply what we want to do and what we think will make a difference, uh, ultimately in our employees, but also for the bottom line of the institution. And so, but to be perfectly honest, our resources, just like many of yours, are, are very limited, but we're proud of the fact that we've been able to move the needle in very important areas. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what that looks like, but we have made progress in employee relations and compensation and outreach and communication and even some technology. And it may be slow going. Um, and this is, this is a marathon. This is definitely not a sprint, but we've been very proud of what we've been able to do over the last couple of years. <clears throat> so our Climb Higher Supervisory Training is a perfect example of feedback that has been received from the Staff Satisfaction Survey exit interviews, and HR's experience on the back end dealing with employee relations. So you'll remember probably last fall when we piloted the supervisory training and we had a great turnout. I think we had 40 some odd people that went through that training. We had scenarios and roundtables and networking, and uh, but also policy interpretation and get some topics up here. We had a behavioral communication assessment, some really good free training that we offered. And we did a post-training post survey. We received great feedback that we incorporated into what we just did this spring semester. We have now branded that training, which is the CLIMB Hire, and it stands for Coaching, Leading, Inspiring, Managing, and Building. That is what, what we want and really what we expect from our people leaders on campus. We haven't made this training mandatory. That was a question that we've received many times. We haven't yet. It's because we've been able to fill our seats and our capacity with volunteers and we'll take those first, of course. But eventually we're gonna start recruiting. And so if this is on your plate and you're interested in doing this, then we want you. And maybe we'll even reach out to you eventually, but we highly recommend this and we do plant the seeds that this is available for our people leaders across campus. It really doesn't matter the level that you're at. 
we would love to be able to offer something for higher level executive administrative leadership too. And, and, and that eventually is on the horizon. We're just not there yet. We have a lot of work to do with our frontline people leaders and they are integral to employee engagement, morale, and all the things people. And we saw a need for a methodical and surgical approach to get the information they need in order to do their people jobs as effective as they can. And so this was born out of that. <clears throat> We've got, we had 60 supervisors today go through this training. So if you think about the teams that they lead, the impact that that really has on those teams. Uh, and again, the value in supervisor training is not one and done. Not checking the box, okay, I did it. This is, this is intended to be ongoing and maybe we can build in levels. We're still kind of in the discovery phase. How can we make this most effective? This is the stuff we like to do. This is stuff we're good. We have knowledge in doing. So we want to give and deliver that information to, to our workforce. So we'll get there. But these are some of the quotes that uh, came back in our post-training survey. We wanted to share with you as well. So you can see it really does run the gamut. Scenarios, topics, um, networking with each other. We go over policies, documentation. And then we also offer our entire team from an FAQ. You get in front of our entire team and you can ask questions to us kind of in an intimate setting, which people really do enjoy. So we're proud to offer that. All right, another training that has been frequently requested is training on search and screen. We have for several years offered one-on-one -on -one training for search chairs, especially on the staff side, but both faculty and staff. Uh, we, in the last couple of years, we've rolled out uh, targeted training for faculty specific searches. There's nuances to both. Yes, there's one policy, but there's nuances to, to the search depending on which one you're doing. But we are proud to finally roll out training for entire search committee. So if you are a stakeholder in a search, if you're preparing for a search, if you know you've got a search maybe coming up, or even if you might serve on a committee at some point, this training is for you. And this is an easy way to, to get that uh, out of the way and just plant some seeds of things you could be thinking about. We have a lot of knowledge to share, a lot of best practices to share when it comes to making your searches effective, efficient, legal, and protecting the candidate experience as well, which is also important because even though a person doesn't get the job, they're going to go out and tell their friends and peers about your interview process. And that is also important. The PR aspect is important. And there's some really little things that you can do that make a big impact on that entire experience. And so please join us. Please mark your calendar. There will be more of these. This is certainly one of them coming up. We'd love for you to join us. We have partnered with our Equal Opportunity, uh, Josh Hayes, and our DEI work group co-chair Michael Crow in delivering this uh, training for you all. So, all right, other development opportunities. <clears throat> so if you noticed a theme, one of the things that we felt very strongly about from an HR perspective is making sure that we were doing what we can to offer development opportunities on this campus. And some of those things, so, you know, are in the way what we just talked about, but also WKU Professional Development Day. So there were some questions about if we plan on offering this again, and yes, we do plan on offering this again. We received feedback. We've already incorporated that into some planning for 2024, and there will be a planning committee that's organized once again after spring semester calms down a little bit, and we'll get that going too. And but I am thrilled to be able to grow that event and make it effective for you. This is a simple, not so simple from a planning perspective, but it is a simple way and something that we can offer to everybody across campus when it's hard to send people to conferences right now. And tell you, we, we don't have the money to send people to conferences right now. So what can we do? I mean, if you think about the knowledge and resources here on this campus, like create the opportunity to bring them together and share what they know and what you need. It's very, it can be very simple. So that's our, that's our goal. The other thing is the catharsis awareness programs. I call them awareness programs because they're a little training, they're a little educational, and they're a little opportunities to talk about sometimes complex topics in a safe space. So we've piloted a couple of these. We intend to do more. Again, this is in partnership with our diversity, equity, inclusion work group in the university. And so we're trying to build out what that infrastructure even looks like. We don't know what it looks like yet, but we know that people want information on what DE&I means 
to the university, to us in our day-to-day -day lives. And so that's what we, and just making our environments inclusive. So that's what we are seeking to do through the catharsis awareness programs that we're doing. Extended disc assessments. We had a couple of questions about this. Currently, this is only offered in our supervisory training, but we hope to be able to offer this to groups and departments on an as needed basis as we can do that for developmental and team building purposes. If you are not familiar with this, again, these are behavioral communication assessments that you can do individually. And, you know, some people have different opinions about what DISC means and what the takeaways are, but there really is an opportunity to learn from self-assessments and take what you leave or take, take what you need and leave what you don't and then figure out how that impacts teams and what you what what that means for your team and how what your role is on that team and I have done DISC I'm, full disclosure I'm a little biased I have done facilitated DISC assessments long before I came to WKU and we have it's almost like okay send in Andrea she's going to do the DISC assessments for for these teams uh, and we really saw some cool things happen with those teams so I am a believer of course that's not sometimes the magic fix, but, but we really do see some really cool things happen from those assessments. And we hope to be able to offer that to more people across campus. So we're working on that. And we hope to be able, when we do that campaign and communicate what that looks like. All right, training calendar, I'm really excited about this. So besides what HR can offer, there's a lot of opportunities across campus. You've seen people send emails out, hey, this training is taking place, we'd love for you to join us. HR wanted to consolidate all those things and provide a central resource for finding out what that information is, what that looks like, and who it's available to. Now, WKU Alumni Association has started offering webinars, some really good webinars, to not only alumni association members. And so we're hoping to include those here. You can see we've already got a few things up here. Uh, we've got our staff search and screen committee, decoding your child's misbehavior. I probably need to do that. And then advanced Excel too. <laughs> so we're hoping to bring all these opportunities so you have a one-stop shop of finding, hey, what's coming up? Let's see what's going on. It's a way for us to organize and kind of refer back to that when people are reaching out to us to ask questions about what's coming up. So this is out there now. It's live. And you also have a form here that if you are doing a training, this is also easy professional development for any of you all that may be an expert in your area and want to train other people about anything. Submit an opportunity. That's a great professional development opportunity to lead a training or facilitate a training in your areas that has very little cost to it. So that opportunity is out there. Uh, the website link is right there. So we encourage you to check back often as we build that out. All right, but wrote, wrote the open enrollment B is now. Gotta put this slide in there. So open enrollment, yes, is in October in the fall time, but that starts now. And we are doing a lot of things. This isn't as visible as some of the other initiatives that we've talked about, but it certainly is a very busy time for us in HR. And as your representatives on from Staff Senate on the budget or on the benefit <laughs> committee can attest, they've already had meetings about projections and planning for benefit year 2024. So this is kind of what that looks like. We've actually had to tweak this timeline just a little bit for budget prep year and BEC needs. So we've actually started these conversations in March. And so right after we implement the open enrollment changes in January, we turn right around and start talking about the next benefit year. So, which is a long process. So that kind of gives you an idea of what's going on and how long that is. It really is almost an entire year of planning and back and forth. And then the benefit committee making recommendations to executive leadership over the summer time period about what that looks like. And sometimes we go back and forth. So. <clears throat> All right. Somebody had a question about this. Employee perks and discounts, can HR bring it back? Yeah, we brought it back. And so now we have this, and I don't have the link up here, so I apologize for that. Maybe we'll send it out and do some social media on this, but we, it needs to be a WKU employee or a member of the WKU community. And so we've tried to, cons like our training calendar, we try to consolidate all these discounts and perks that are available to WKU community uh, members, employees, and, and put them here in kind of a categorized list. So you've got athletics discounts, bank and lender, mortgage, food and beverage, lodging, military, tickets, technology, travel, 
tuition discount program, WKU Preston Center, WKU Store, runs the gamut. I know the most recent addition that I don't see on this list is entertainment. I think there's holiday world discount tickets on there now. So you might want to go check it out if you're planning on the holiday world. Um, but we plan to build this out as well. And we you know in a time where inflation is crazy high, everybody's using coupons again. And I know I do. And so this is just an easy way to save a little bit on things that you're probably already doing and buying. So we brought this back, look for some additional communication on this as well. Total rewards. <clears throat> I wanted to talk about this because we did get a question, one question about why I don't understand the value in this, why did you send this out? And I think it's important to know when compensation is the number one topic amongst everybody on campus, I think the better question is why wouldn't we tell you what WKU is investing in you? Because it is more than your just your base pay. But I understand that does not pay your rent, that does not put food on the table. I understand that. But it is a very important part of the conversation. And so this was the first attempt, at least since I've been here, that we've ever done something like that. So we're very proud of the work that we put into it. It really just tells you probably what you already know. But in many cases, we know that many people didn't know the value of some of those things. And that is what we wanted to do. That is the transparency that we're seeking. And I also know that there were people that wanted to know about benefits that they necessarily didn't need in this season of life. And so the narrative section on the total reward statement also reminded you about all the benefits that are available to you. You may, I mean, tuition discounts is a great example. You know, you may, I'm going to use myself as, as an example. I cannot imagine going back to school right now because of the season of life that I'm in. But that changes, and sometimes frequently. And I'm like, oh, maybe I should reconsider whatever this, taking advantage of this benefit is. So reminding you what is available to you and getting it out, pushing it out and getting it in front of you was our goal. And that's all that it was. Any questions about that? Okay. All right. This is pretty exciting. We have somebody that is supporting this project in this room right now, Emily. HR is going to be rolling out, and actually it's live today, our team dynamic ticketing service. <laughs> You're familiar with submitting tickets for service through ITS. HR will also be offering the service for a variety of, of things. We know that not everybody knows who to contact in HR for things, but we don't want that to be the barrier of why you don't submit something. We also don't really want you to send a, a random email with things that you may or may not need just to simply update directory information or to get an affiliate member onboarded. So we're going to, we have provided templates and you can see here, this is where we've started with the services that you can request. Templates to get exactly what you, what we need from you in order to make these changes for you one time, okay? So sometimes there was back and forth, somebody send us an email, I need this done. And there'd be an exchange of emails going back and forth. Emails get lost. Things get misinterpreted. By doing it this way, this is a much more efficient way of capturing the information the first time around. And then this way, we can also track our volume on things. We haven't really been able to track our volume on things. And we need to know, where are we spending our time? Where are we not spending our time? So we're excited to do this. We've, we've had wonderful support from ITS in helping us roll this out. Uh, Charles Clemens and Emily have been wonderful. I am so thankful for them and their patience with our limited IT knowledge sometimes. And Brittany Wofford has been wonderful. We rely on them heavily <clears throat> to roll this out. So this is coming. There will be more information. These are probably some of the most frequent services that are requested via email. So you will be redirected to these reaching out to us about this. And we can simply send you a link. You can fill out the ticket. And then we get the information we need to do what you need for us to do. More information to come. Oh, yes, okay, compensation study. All right. <laughs> Mindy, come on down. <laughs> okay. Well, for those of you that don't know me, I am Mindy Hutchins. I am now senior analyst in human resources, formerly <clears throat> compensation analyst. And so when we did the compensation study, I was one of the point main points of contact for the study. Uh, so just to give us a reminder of the history and background, sometimes I feel like we have 
talked about this over and over and over again, but things come up and time changes and we forget where we have been and where we're going. So in spring of 2019, which seems like a long time ago now, we started the compensation study and that started with simply um, requesting job descriptions and starting to get data pulled together. We were working with Siegel Consulting. They even changed names in the process. They were Simpson back then. If you remember, there was a little bump in the road in spring 2020 when we had a global pandemic. And we as a team and as with our senior leadership decided that that was just not the time, that was not the focus to continue to be working on a project like that. And so it was put on official pause. If you fast forward to the next summer when we really started trying to pick up the momentum of getting back into that project, we had a little thing come up on campus called a BSIP. Um, I'm sure many of your areas were impacted, probably similar to ours. But one thing to keep in mind is that during that BSIP process, when we initially started this compensation study in spring of 2019, we, have, we had five FTE um, individuals, leaders, director level working on the compensation study. As of the BSIP, we adjusted down to two, and that was Andrea and myself. And so, as you know, that's not everything that we do. So just to keep in mind about how that project changed from 2019 to the summer of 2021 and the expectations and quite honestly, the ability to get things done quickly, all of that was drastically changed through the visa process. So you continue on to the next spring in 2022 when the initial results were released. Um, everyone did receive, an, it, unless you had gone through a job change, the majority of people on campus did receive an email with information about where their job landed in, a, in the pay ban and the new salary structure. Uh, some of the outcomes with that initial results were um, approximately <laughs> 160 faculty and staff did receive an increase because it was identified that their salary was paid below the minimum of the pay ban that they were designated. And so we, um, the leadership team did decide that that was the best way to use what funds we did have to, as an outcome from the results. And then um, based on one thing to keep in mind is that the census data was from August of 2021. And so uh, we are now working to catch up, if you will. One thing we did decide as we started the compensation study, which hindsight, it was a good decision, was that we would not stop. Hiring, we would not stop job changes. We would allow that to continue. Well, as our timeline expanded, those became of individuals. So we're currently working on um, with leaders and working with the salary structure that we have established to make sure that everyone has a designated pay band. Let's see if I can click the right button. So far, I'm not. There we go. Or not. I'm just killing the information. There we go. Okay, so what are the additional phases? That was one of the questions that was asked. Um, so we had the initial phase and the initial increases that happened as for individuals that were below the minimum of their pay band. Since that time, some decisions that were made was that um, January 1, we had an across the board increase. That may not seem like, oh, well, that's not really connected with the compensation study, but sure it is. I mean, that was the um, decision made and how to use the funds that might individuals might think we should use towards a compensation study, increasing compensation. We identified that really the best use of those funds this January was just to do an across the board for everyone. Going forward, what does that look like? As you know, it's one of the questions we continue to have is what are the additional phases? When will we see more increases, things like that? One thing that's important to keep in mind is that really going forward, any additional university-wide compensation initiatives will call new recommendations to our senior leadership. And so some of those may look like, and these are some ideas that HR has and that we like to present to BEC, do we continue across the board increases? Do we potentially identify a minimum pay amount that all staff members should um, be paid on campus? Do we adjust market placement for WKU positions? So that gets in a little bit of HR speak, but um, we have a certain market placement that's been chosen for our university. Do we want to uh, tweak that any? And that could result in, dis in additional compensation. Or do we want to adjust individual salaries within the particular pay band? And this could be based on a lot of things. It could be based on years of service. It could be based on performance. So again, there are a multitude of things that we can do with now the salary structure that was developed. But the biggest takeaway from this is that HR makes recommendations and we use data that we have and we try to educate. It goes through BEC and our senior leadership to make those decisions. Why are my slides delayed? <laughs> there we go. Um, so what else? 
So these are the things that have happened behind the scenes that uh, I really enjoy that have been a great part of the compensation study that probably you haven't seen out in public and may or may not even care about or it may seem boring or but they're very important foundational pieces to our our compensation and our how our salaries are paid in both faculty and staff. So now we do have what we call is a job description vault um, through the JAQ process, which you'll, again, you'll remember everyone submitted their information about their jobs at the very beginning of the study. We were able to pull out all of that information. And so we do have somewhat of a job description vault. Prior to this, um, job descriptions were officially maintained in the department. And I don't know if you've ever tried to find a job description, but I can tell you that it's very inconsistent how those are held, very inconsistent who's in charge of those, where are they? We think HR has it, HR thinks you have it. And so this at least gives us a foundational piece where we can now have some data that as individuals need their job description or a supervisor needs to see how it's changed. We have that from 2021. Um, what we're currently working on is our pay administration guidelines, and this is really just taking what's in the heads of some people like myself or other HR leaders or our senior leadership and putting it on paper. It's important from a transparency standpoint. It's important from a leadership standpoint that everyone have access to the same guidelines. So you can see how should decisions be made? What's the best way to make this decision? What's the typical practice or policy at WKU? And so that's going into, I think it's about a 30 page document at this point um, that we have continued to tweak and work with and fine tune um, with academic affairs, with our senior leadership. We had a committee um, of staff members and faculty members that also gave feedback on this. And so we are currently at the final stages of that, which is excited, exciting. Um, and we do plan to have cabinet approval of that in the fall. And once we have cabinet approval, we'll be able to continue to share that. And then that will, we will then roll out some trainings to go along with that. So it can help you make decisions as a leader um, when it comes to compensation for your team, um, but give you some resources that, you know, are not so easily, easily recognizable for everyone um, and not make you feel like you have to just contact HR every time you have a compensation question. Um, also right now what we're actively working on with the compensation study is those modified or newly hired positions since August of 2021 and so um, we've had some individuals reach out and say hey my job changed I don't think my pay band is right or we've had supervisors to say I had hired this individual after the initial results can we talk about what the pay band looks like uh, so we are continuing to identify those and make sure that we have a pay band for every full-time position on campus. We're continuing to do ongoing salary structure updates. So while the compensation study in, in, in the initial plan of what was expected and what was to be completed is done, we are having ongoing changes within departments. And so whether that be market equity adjustments or departmental reorganizations, that's still happening. So just because the actual compensation study has ended doesn't mean that all actions have stopped. And so we work with leaders, um, division leaders, department leaders, as they have um, money available or if they you know, have vacant positions, is it best to backfill that position the same or should we be creative and do something different? Those are ongoing conversations that are happening really on a daily and definitely weekly basis in HR. And then one of the things that is very important, but is very behind the scenes, is that we now have to take the data that we receive through the comp study and put that into Banner. How many of you use Banner on a regular? <laughs> Can you imagine what that's taking <laughs> to take 1,000 plus positions? And that's just staff. I haven't even started on faculty. I can't even get there yet. But to take 1,000 positions and literally update them, I mean, the amount of manual input that that is taking just just know that. <laughs> and so it's happening and it will be an exciting tool once we get all of that in there and able to pull that information out of Banner. So when a supervisor looks at a job setup, they can see what pay band is this in? What is that minimum of that job? What should I be paying that individual? And it will then allow us to pull that information out to share it with broader groups too. But it's ugly behind the scenes, I'll tell you that. Okay, so from a compensation standpoint, some of the staff senate questions or the, some of the questions that were submitted to staff senate, are we still using Siegel? What and when are the additional phases? Um, and will there be additional studies or adjustments? So short answer is we are not still working with Siegel on additional compensation initiatives. 
The compensation study was completed. We did receive the expected outcome of a new salary structure, which was what we expected to receive. Um, and then I cover all of that. Will there be additional studies or adjustments? You know, I can't speak to what will be going forward from additional studies and adjustments. It's a constant conversation that we're having. And again, adjustments are happening on campus from a standpoint of working with departments and divisions, but from a broad university standpoint, that compensation study is weekly. Um, one specific question we had is what is wage comp compression? So we often hear people say wage salary compression, there's compression, we have wave compression, we have inversion, and that's just HR speak for a scenario that happens particularly when you have individuals that have been here a long time and then you have newly hired individuals because WKU hasn't necessarily kept up with the market pace when it comes to salary. When you hire a new individual, you oftentimes will get compression and literally that means compressed salaries. So you have someone that's been here a long time or even a supervisor, you hire someone in new that comes in at a higher rate, they are compressed. That's literally what that means. Sometimes you have inversion, which means they're even opposite of what you would expect them to be. We do recognize that that is a scenario that happens on campus more than we would like for it to. And we continue to work with supervisors as they, as they post new positions or as they hire new positions to make suggestions on how they may resolve that or some creative solutions on what to do with that. Um, but we do recognize that that is something that happens on campus. So when and how will additional compensation initiatives be completed? Again, it's important to note that any university-wide compensation initiative will be something that works through HR. And again, we're part of the recommendation process, part of the creativity process, but really that rolls through BEC and the senior leadership from a decision-making standpoint. And then as funding is available, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but we are still working with departments to make changes. So again, not all things have stopped since the compensation study is completed. Uh, we regularly work with department and divisional leaders to make changes in their area. Are these a question I should know. That's one from the university. <clears throat> from the universe. <laughs> from the, the bank, oh, okay. um, so the question is, are the pay bands from 2019 adjusted annually for COLA? Short answer is no. At this time, they have not been adjusted. All right, Andrew, you're up next, Mike. So these are some of the other questions that have come up. Yeah, this is the same. So. <laughs> there you go. Okay. There were some questions. Okay. There were some questions that came through that I'm not so sure are HR questions, but we've reached out to areas in an attempt to answer them. So the first question, why is fall break for the 2023-2024 academic calendar on a Monday and Tuesday versus the usual Thursday and Friday? So I reached out to the registrar's office. And so the decision was really focused around instructional time for students because of the Thanksgiving holiday following Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. They thought offering fall break, break closure on Monday and Tuesday would be would balance out the semester from an instructional time standpoint. I think you all have reps on the calendar committee. If anybody that's consistent with your understanding, is that, is that right? Yeah. Right. So there you go. What can, and, and I think it's important to note too that our holiday calendars for faculty and staff really revolve around the academic calendar. So they set the academic calendar and then we determine what the holidays look like. What considerations, discussions have there been about reducing the cost of staff parking? <clears throat> so I reach out to parking and transportation about this. WK parking fees remain in the lower third compared to other benchmark institutions and are considered relatively low in comparison. They, the plan is for parking fees to remain. There's no change in parking fees for the upcoming year and they remain the same. So that'll be the fifth year that there's been no increase in parking fees. So, and then they have increased the pay-as-you-go options and expanded some because we know not everybody's coming to campus every day, maybe like they used to and what they once were. So there's some more customized mm -hmm. options that may better fit your uh, budget and lifestyle needs as far as parking on campus too. Who do staff turn to with ongoing problems with their supervisor? So HR is available to provide guidance on navigating complex and sensitive situations at any time. We also encourage, and something I think we give a lot of guidance on, is if you feel like you have a conflict with your supervisor, we often will recommend going to your, referring back to your leadership hierarchy. Have you talked to your, 
to your hierarchy, to the next level supervisor, the next level uh, leader. Because what we often see is that so many of the interpersonal issues have an operational context to them. They understand the environment, they understand the culture. And so referring you back is not just to get it off our plate, it's because <laughs> that is typically the best, best practice, best method of resolving conflict. And that is what we continue to recommend when there's interpersonal issues, when it's appropriate. Sometimes it's not always appropriate, but we can partner and navigate with you on those situations. So there's not a one-size-fits-all solution to that, but we can help with that and navigating those situations. <clears throat> How do we get funding for research as a staff member? So I reached out to the graduate school on this question, and apparently, I did not know this, so this was a learning opportunity for me. Although the RCAP internal grants are typically available for full-time faculty and instructors, the grad school does consider case-by-case -case, uh, requests for that align with the strategic goals of the university. And so you can submit your justification and request to this email address. And as long as you have support from your immediate supervisor and your dean or VP of your area, they will consider those requests. So that opportunity is available. What mental health services and or initiatives are available for employees? <clears throat> I never miss an opportunity to plug our employee assistance program. I feel like our utilization has picked up slightly because we've done a very good job of incorporating that reminder in everything we do. Um, and whether it's speaking to you all like this or in other communication methods, uh, if there's employee relations issues, we're plugging this information. And often, I think there's a stigma sometimes associated with this. Well, you know, I don't have X problem, but I don't need to use it. But you'd be really surprised about the resources that are available on there. And I think it's a good reminder that it is available. It does not come through HR. HR has no idea who is using the service. It is available 24-7, completely confidential. It's available to you as an employee and members of your household. So you don't have to be because it is confidential. Your, your household can use this service. And you do get up to five free counseling sessions on uh, through the EAP as a benefit. So that's that's pretty that's pretty great. And then also, there's a lot of opportunities that I know Peggy Crow is the first person that comes to mind, and their counseling center does a great job of providing opportunities to learn about different mindfulness seminars that really are open to everyone. And so we hope that that training calendar we talked about will kind of pull in some of those resources when they're available, so you can check and keep track of maybe what's available to take advantage of in that way. Will all of the colleges be implementing the mental health hour eventually? This question is in reference to CHHS's initiative. Uh, they're piloting a program to, that focuses on holistic well-being and by providing faculty and staff with a wellness hour. And there's parameters in place. They have a big program. This is certainly a specialty in their research areas, and they are monitoring and piloting this program <laughs> this academic year. We always welcome opportunities as HR to partner with deans and VPs and leaders in other areas across campus on initiatives they think might work for their areas and what they do and what their culture is and what they promote. So we're open to that. We will continue to do that. Of course, there probably will be some takeaways from this wellness hour that exists in CHHS. And so if it's something that we feel like we can replicate or duplicate, we will be all over it. There's probably gonna be some learning and challenges uh, to that program too. We don't, we don't know, but they're piloting. That's the end. I made it this far. <clears throat> Sorry. And I think we still have a little bit of time for Ronaldo. So I apologize. And I'll pull up your slide for you. So here you go. Andrew, uh, just wanted to give a quick update on the budget for next year, fiscal year 2024. Uh, if you look at the timeline that I have up here, you can sort of see the um, many months that goes into planning the budget for the next year. Um, I would really call this as our active budget season. So between November until June, when it's uh, approved by the Board of Regents. Uh, but there's also work that goes on in the budget outside of this, which I'll probably call the passive uh, budget development. Uh, so if you look at no November is really when we have our budget development kickoff. Uh, we outline some of the assumptions, priorities in the budget. Um, and you'll see the theme throughout this is the reliance on. Um, 
So we get those first projections in November. I believe applications open around the October time frame. So uh, August. Yeah. There we go. Thank you, Brian. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in November, we start looking at the data, application data, um, rely on enrollment and student experience to provide projections and some that informs our tuition revenue, uh, which is really almost half of our budget. So um, uh, we are quite dependent on enrollment and tuition. January, February timeline, uh, this is when the, the BEC uh, becomes more active. Um, so funding requests are submitted to the BEC in this timeline from the support units. Um, I know Andrea maybe touched a little bit on some of their initiatives that, that sort of run through the BEC, but that's uh, university-wide on the support side. Um, and again, enrollment and tuition revenue, uh, we receive monthly updates on those as new data becomes available, um, and that informs our budget planning. Uh, Mark, so the BEC after going through hearing presentations, uh, talking through the, the different funding uh, recommendations, they, they do submit their recommendations to uh, senior leadership. Uh, that happens in the March time frame, as well as um, finalizing the enrollment projections, student financial aid. Uh, this is sort of when things start coming together uh, with the budget and we start finalizing a lot of the assumptions. Also in March, every other year, the Council on Post-Secondary Education sets the tuition rate ceilings for the next two years, and then that sort of informs what we can do on tuition rate increases. April, so this is where we are right now within the process. Um, the Provost had his convention meetings with the deans, and those wrapped up, I believe, yesterday. Um, and as part of our budget model, and um, that's where the provost goes through with each of the deans, they look at their budgets and, uh, and sort of decide on which initiatives will be funded and investments within the academic colleges. We do the final calibration to ensure a balanced budget. So as we look at those enrollment uh, projections, uh, looking at BEC's funding recommendations to senior leadership, um, and I'll take this opportunity to stress, uh, I'm a non-voting member on the BEC, um, but I did want to point out as, as they deliberate uh, in October, I believe they start meeting, um, compensation uh, has clearly been a priority to, uh, to the budget executive committee. Um, and to, to add to Mindy and Andrew, what they sort of talked about the compensation study, it's not all going to be solved in one year, um, but as long as we're making progress each year, and uh, I like to see that as a priority uh, for the BEC also. Later this month, uh, once we finalize the budget, we do have our budget workshops with the Board of Regents. Um, that gives them a chance to view the budget and ask us uh, questions, detailed questions um, that they'd like to see before we uh, move to their approval in June. May and June, so next month, and then into June. Um, the last piece right now with the budget is uh, after we hear from the provost on, on his uh, decisions on the academic colleges, the state performance funding allocation has not been finalized yet. So we have completed our data validation with the state, um, and we should receive uh, draft models within the next couple of weeks. So that's the last pending item before we can uh, truly have a balanced budget for next year. Um, the Board of Regents, they do approve vote on the budget. I believe at June 2nd is when that special poll meeting is scheduled. And then the Council on Post-Secondary Education will also approve our tuition rates, uh, depending on what our Board of Regents has approved. Uh, so that's really the, the six, seven months uh, of, of uh, active budget development planning uh, that, that takes place and sort of give you a summary of that. With our budget model, uh, I wanna point out one difference between I would say a couple of years ago and where we are today is uh, typically the enrollment projections would only be enrollment student experience function. The width and right calculations would be a finance function, uh, the academics, and everyone sort of operated separately. Uh, what we're seeing now is um, everyone's involved throughout the entire process. Everyone's able to give input throughout the entire process, and everyone is able to sort of give their blessing um, throughout the entire process. It's really been collaborative, and uh, and I think it's been a great success for the university. 
that's all I had to share on, on the budget at this point. It's still ongoing. Uh, the decisions haven't been final yet, so I can't share too many details until the board approves it. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions at this point. That's all I had to share. And with that, if, if I can, I'll turn it over to questions broadly, um, if that's okay, if there are any other outstanding questions for either Ronaldo or for Andrea or Mindy, um, if y'all don't mind me putting me on the spot in case there are any other questions out there um, that people would like to have addressed. I have a comment uh, on, the, uh, on HR. Um, you know, I've, I've been a hiring official now. I'm going to my 10th year. And um, I have currently two searches and like four requisitions. Um, and we've had several actions that we've taken internally. It's a revolving door. But I, I want to stress to people, we talked about the compression was mentioned. <laughs> and I, and I want to say that it's not always intentional. Um, I accidentally was flagged uh, because of a compression issue I almost caused uh, in, in, a, in a search related to a hire or a promotion. And um, <clears throat> that's something that I don't think would have been flagged several years ago. Um, and I can say that in all of this process, it's been much better recently. By recently, I mean the last couple of years uh, in every dealing that I've had. Uh, and, and I ask some really really stupid questions sometimes. But I will say, having that flag so I didn't do it was a, a, a great benefit because it's better for employees, it's better for supervisors if we don't uh, unintentionally even cause one of those injuries. So uh, I, I really appreciate the work that and the evolution of that area. And I, I know that the, the staffing issue that they've had for the last few years I just, I, I have nothing but compliments for each other. Thank you. Thank you. I want to second that as well. And I also want to say that, you know, as a staff member, it's our responsibility to show up and to ask the questions and to come to these, to fill out the staff engagement surveys as well. You know, you, we get a lot of rumbling of people frustrated or not doing that, but there's so many opportunities out there. There's trainings there. I mean, we have to be a part of it. I, I know we're all overworked and we have a lot on our plate and we're all doing several jobs, but if you just take a few minutes, I mean, HR, like David was saying, I mean, they're always have been there when I ask questions or they are helping, you know, do that. And they're providing the supervisor training, they're providing these other trainings, but if we don't participate, we're never going to learn. So, I mean, I think that happens with students a lot too. They don't engage. They they want to engage, but it's part of the staff member. We need to engage as well. Thank you. So, when you talk about the compensation study, last year we kind of referred to it as compensation study, compensation initiative phase one. Mm -hmm. um, I think I expected you to, to brand it as like what phase two was going to be. The phase two, we should understand, will we'll run through the BEC, right? That's kind of, if we were going to call it phase two. Right? Yeah, some of the phase two, if you will, you know, we tried to be very careful to call it, you know, the initial phase, the first phase. Um, it will be ongoing. I mean, we couldn't put a number on the amount of phases. If you truly had to sit down and, and put a number to it, it would be very challenging. A lot of the phases, if you will, um, Am I okay to answer here? I'm pretty loud. Yes, so. yeah, sure. <laughs> um, are a lot of the behind the scenes things that if you yeah. ask, I'm glad to share again, you know, about the things about updating position classes and things like that. A lot of it's going to be behind the scenes when it comes to the true increases that individuals want to see or talk about, then yes, that's going to be more through the BEC process. Um, you know, if you had to say, was there a phase two, then that would have been the January one. It wasn't really called that because again, we didn't put numbers to all the different phases. Um, but I guess that would be the a, a second phase we had of pay increases, if you will. Um, but then anything, yes, from there, we'll go through the BEC process. Thank you. I want to make a general comment and I want to be careful as well. And um, something that I'm curious about, there was several references to going to the leadership and 
you know, the BEC and the leadership, your, your leadership. And we still have guys that are frustrated by, I'll call it this system. And where do we go when we feel like our leadership, and we talked about this before, there needs to be some kind of accountability for a lack of response. I don't know what how else to speak plainly, but I took I came on to the staff senate because I wanted to make a difference, and I still feel frustrated, like I'm not making a difference. But how do we get the attention of our leadership to consider things that seem to be ignored? And and that's just a general statement without going into details. And it sounds like, yes, we need to reach out to HR and then HR is saying the best avenues to work with our leadership, but we are still having some frustrations with some guys that have value in what they do. And it seems like that value is ignored. And there's, I've heard several statements. And again, I don't want to get into the specifics of it, but you've got people with years of experience. You've got people that have worked here and longevity counts for something because that's, that shows some loyalty. And I'm not saying everyone fits into that category, um, but it's obvious who your, your good players are on the team. And it seems like there's some good players that are still being overlooked. And um, I say that on the behalf of several people because I feel like they're being overlooked still. And so where do we go if we feel like we're not getting simple down to earth, hey, let's talk about this and find out why instead of being told, no, that's not gonna happen. It doesn't matter how long you've been here, no. You know, if, anyways, I just, I'll leave it at that. But I feel, I still feel frustrated for these guys. My, my case is not like theirs and, um, I, I want to see something done for some of these guys. I know, you know, I'm in the trenches with these guys and it seems like there's people being overlooked in this whole process. And so I'll just say that I can feel myself feeling frustrated. And I think they're frustrated as well, but where do we, who do we go to? How do we get something done? It seems like, and I know this wheel turns very slowly. I'm learning that. Um, how do we get something done? Because we're not talking about millions of dollars for some of these guys. We're not talking about that. And I know it's, I'm, I'm beginning to understand this is felt university wide. Um, but buildings don't fix themselves. So it takes people to do that. And it's about the people. It's not necessarily about um, how long this process takes. It's about people. It's about taking care of those people that are willing to work and, and have proven themselves. And so I'm, I'm not going to go into the specifics and I feel like I'm going to vomit right now just trying to say this, but something needs to happen without it saying next year, next year, three weeks, a month from now. Because when we first, when I've, when a group of us first approached the staff Senate, it was in uh, September of 21, I guess it was. And it seems like this process has been so slow going. And um, we heard comments like, well, there's been some money set aside to take care of, but all of it hasn't been taken care of. It's only part of it's been taken care of. And, and through this whole process on a personal level, I've got some guys that, have not exactly been very friendly to me. Um, and one way that I've benefited, they have not been offended. And um, I've certainly felt, felt the effects of that. Um, and, and, you know, there are some guys that they need to change their attitude without a doubt. But there's some guys too that you can't keep 
ignore them. They can't be ignored. Something's got to be done. And so I'm just saying this out of frustration still. So I just want to be careful, but where do we go? That's, that's, you know, if we feel like our leadership is not hearing us, where do we go? First, oh, I'll go ahead and address it. So I have, I'm sure that your colleagues appreciate you advocating on their behalf. There is no doubt about that. And I, I think that it's no surprise that you, I, I know the group that you work with, and I know that compensation concerns are the utmost priority within your group. And I am familiar when you all came uh, in front of Staff Senate and then also to executive leadership to express your concerns about compensation. We have seen significant changes within your organization and changes. I will say that HR doesn't get to delegate what money is available to make those things happen. And I'm gonna assume that your frustrations are about compensation. So that's where I'm coming from because sometimes this is not a one size fits all solution depending on what it is. And I am familiar with some very specific situations within your group about probably who you're talking about um, that we're working on, okay? So, but to answer generally, it's not feasible nor realistic to fix all the problems all at once. It is not. We rely so so much on enrollment, and we know our state appropriations have also, I believe, gone down overall. Um, and enrollment numbers drive what our ability is to do things such as programs, initiatives, and ultimately compensation adjustments. Uh, I don't know what the adjustment rate is for DFM as a whole, but I know it's significant. We've been involved on the back end of those changes. We've seen it happen. So the fact that there is movement occurring is positive. And you're right, they're not gonna happen overnight. They're not gonna happen within a year. It really is as budget determines um, availability of funding. And that's, and pay strategy is, is uh, although we make recommendations and unless there's a policy violation or, or something like that, you know, we, we make recommendations on, do you have a question? Uh, following on that, where is the policy for changing someone's job title or description or something along those lines, because I have had several people sure. ask me, how can they do this? This is demoting me without telling me they're demoting me. Sure. And there's a lot to unpack there with, with all of that. You know, it's not illegal to change jobs, to change job description. Now, there are consequences to that. There are consequences to that in terms of morale, engagement, turnover, all those things, which we do not want. And so by providing recommendations and best practices to leadership, which is what we do, guidance, consultations, and consequences of what will happen when you make decisions like that. Doesn't necessarily violate a policy. Do we have a policy on that? We do that? not. Okay. We do not. Something might need to be looked into. Okay. We hear you. So, but again, to go back to address the other concern about changes overnight, I understand your frustration. This frustration is not only within your unit. Uh, but there is a, a, a methodical way of going about it. And to be honest, from a staff perspective, there's been over, if you exclude the one, one increase of last year, there has been over 25% of staff that have been impacted, full-time staff that have been impacted by some type of adjustment. That is significant. That is significant. In one year, over 25% of full-time staff have been impacted by some type of adjustment outside the one, one increase. We have never seen that before. So it's not fair to say when with all these other years, we have not been able to make the adjustments that we needed, you're not gonna catch up. You're not gonna catch up in one year, two years or three years. And so it's up to us to advocate for individuals and what we see and what the consequences might be. And we do that. You all unfortunately don't always get to see that happen, but it happens. I can tell you with some of the leaders that we work with in here, the flag that you got about compression, you said it, that it wouldn't happen, wouldn't have happened before. So those are the parameters that are in place now and with the pay administration guidelines, you don't always have to have a policy about everything, but there are certainly best practices. And we are concerned, I'm concerned when you tell me that you are frustrated. And when I talk to your, your peers and your colleagues about, you know, how can we help? And sometimes it's not up to manage you guys. You know, we, we want to partner with your leadership and there's tactics and ways that we can go about trying to, to, to give that feedback in an appropriate manner. Sometimes it's creative creatively navigating those situations. We hear you and that work continues. To, to bridge onto what Andrea has said as a hiring manager, I want to stress this. And also you all that don't know, 
we have funding from multiple sources. So we're not 100% reliant upon E&G money. We have grant money. We have donations that help fund some positions. So we have a lot of flexibility when it comes to uh, the evolution of how we think. Um, I have to, I choose to follow the advice as the best that I can that comes from HR because they're there as a, as a, they're the professionals. Part of it is because if I do something that is outside of best practice, um, it could lead, not because there is liability, but it could lead to someone leaving and suing us. Um, that's a, it doesn't mean it'll be for, with any merit, it doesn't mean they'll win, but we just don't want that to happen. And, and I'm with them. I just promoted a, a few internal people, and that's not something that was very easy to do a few years ago. But I believe in longevity and loyalty, and we want to represent that. Now, we have an HR that will work with a hiring manager that wants to do that. I want to stress that we have an HR that will work with any hiring manager, VP that wants to evolve and grow their area or, or pay people what they see fits within their budgets. Several colleges have between 86 and 92% of their entire budgets tied up in personnel. You know, my area, and I'm not trying to brag, but we have about 60% tied up in personnel. When you look at best practices as nonprofits, that percentage caps out around 75 or 80 in most cases. Now we're a different type of nonprofit and it's highly personnel centered around faculty and staff. But, you know, part of it is, is there any flexibility at all in the budget? And if there is, that's up to the leadership to be the advocate. HR, I promise you, will facilitate change if it can happen. And they'll tell you the nuts and bolts about it. I mean, when I got flagged on that compression issue, I was thrilled that I got flagged. I was upset that I was so, that I missed it and, and it went in that way. Um, but I will take you, I will tell you, it takes the leadership being willing. They don't have to follow their advice. As Andrea said, I mean, it's, I'm not saying they aren't, I want to stress that, but the, you know, there's policy and there's legal and there's best practice and all these things sort of mixed together. And they try to do everything that's within the best practice, longevity, sustainability, all of those factors mixed in together. Um, but your leadership has to be willing to follow the advice that they're giving. That's my opinion. I'm, I certainly am not. I believe, Andrea, that you and your staff are doing what you can. I, I believe that. And um, I know things are certainly dependent on budget and leadership. And um, I I'm wondering if maintenance has the budget that they need to operate in. And I know I, I personally hear all the time, we need to bill for that. We need to bill for that. And there's certain aspects of my job that I do that I know are billable. And one of the positions I took with attitude wise was I'm going to make sure I do everything I can that's billable because I want to make sure I get money i want to make sure that i'm a paying for myself and, and making sure that i hey i'm gonna make sure i get this done so i can get a raise and um through this whole process i do feel like i know that i've been better taken care of i have no doubt it's these these select few guys that has me frustrated and and i i I know that they have as much value as I do. And so 
Um, I, I know that there uh, it doesn't matter where you go, you're going to have those guys that are going to want to sit back and go along for the ride and get what they can out of it without putting any effort into it. And those are the guys that I'm not here for. I'm here for those guys that I know are putting forth effort. And, and I have no doubt that, the, that you are doing the best you can. And I, I feel frustrated, I guess, with the lack of response from our leadership. And I know it does take the budget and it does take the leadership. And uh, I hope that this prompts something to happen. I don't want anybody to lose their job. Um, you know, I want those that are putting forth effort, you know, there's ones that are dependable. And I, I want them to be taken care of. And that's where I feel my frustration at. But I do appreciate what you all have done. It has certainly... The, the impact on me has been greater in the past six months than it has in my 14 years here. Let me put it that way. And I appreciate that. Um, but I just am, I want to do my due diligence and voice my frustration for those guys that I can see that I work with in the trenches that have, for lack of a better term, seem like they've been overlooked in this process. But anyways, that's but I do appreciate what you're doing. Too. We hear you. Thank you. Uh, so how could uh, people understand where they slot in their pay band um, with relation to uh, minimum how should they understand where they slot? So I guess it means, I guess the question is, what do they mean by understand? So, you know, if someone doesn't know their pay band, I can share that with them so they can reach out to HR. And then um, the salary structures are posted online. So that would show the men, men, and max. But then if they're wondering why am I in this certain placement in the band, um, that's some of the stuff that will take some time to resolve, but part of the pay admin guidelines will include uh, perfect world scenarios of where you potentially should be based on different aspects. Um, it breaks it down into really, we look at quartiles, which is breaking it down into, you know, even smaller portions of the pay band to see as you progress for that. Um, so, you know, that's, trying to answer maybe a specific question very generally, but um, the pay admin guidelines will offer more information about that as it's shared publicly. Okay, that might've been what they meant. How do, how do they understand it, the pay admin guidelines? So with them being new pay bands, you know, there hasn't been a lot of management within the band because they're brand new. Um, now, as job changes are happening or positions are vacated and posted, um, we are managing within the pay bands. Uh, so, you know, it is going forward, but where they land now and how they landed there, you know, really at this point, the issue is, are they at minimum or above? And then from there, it will just take time to, for individuals to progress through those bands. Thank you. Yep. there any other questions for Andrea, Mindy, or Ronaldo? Well, thank you very much for coming and speaking with us today and addressing the questions that we received. Uh, we appreciate your time and your efforts. Um, so thank you again very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yes, you. thank you for having us. So next on our agenda, we will move on to our officer committee and staff regent reports, beginning with staff regent Brink. Hey, this is a, a committee meeting week. We have uh, committee meetings on Friday morning. And to give you all the refresher on that, so you'll have uh, um, committee meetings where the committees will approve action items before we go to the full board. Uh, in this case, there was a, a, a lot of effort put into getting several action items uh, into this agenda. On the academic side, we have nine. Um, 
And two of those I'm going to highlight briefly just for explanation. If anybody has any questions, if you've read through these, that, that this has been out a few days, but it has been amended. Um, there's uh, action item seven, which is an approval of program suspension, Master of Arts and Folk Studies. Uh, I am not on the Academic Affairs Committee, but I will be voting to approve that when it comes to the full board. And here is the reasoning that we were given. The faculty have decided to close the Master of Arts in Folk Studies to new admissions. Uh, the action item language credits the reason as low enrollment. The chair and the dean and the provost all support the faculty's decision. I have heard nothing to the contrary of that, so therefore I will be moving in favor when it comes to the full board, if it passes committee, to uh, limit or su suspend that academic program. Along with that, there I, I want to give a little tiny bit of clarity on uh, uh, action item number eight, which is approval of program suspension of Bachelor of Arts in Agriculture. People are saying to me, wait a minute, why are we getting rid of a bachelor's program in agriculture? It is a niche, pro well, it's not really the program, it's an option in the Bachelor of Science in Agriculture that requires a second major or a minor. So that so there's two options. One, you don't have to have a second major or minor, and the other one you do. It just gets rid of this one uh, where you do have to have a second major or minor. So those students will uh, move over uh, if they want to, or that'll be taught out. There's not really uh, an impact on the budget on this one. It's a neutral impact, and, and on the uh, program suspension on folk uh, studies, it will either have a positive or neutral impact. That's to be determined. Those are the two in academic affairs. I want to stress I'm not on that committee, but uh, unless anybody emails me and has any concerns, I'll be voting in the affirmative on all those actions. Finance and budget, uh, there's a, a list of uh, Several things, uh, Shane Spiller and I, the faculty regent and I had a meeting with uh, Susan and her staff yesterday. It was very nice of Susan to attend that meeting given her uh, that she was in Louisville during it. Um, and uh, she gave us a full hour as we needed. We went over the budget versus actual report that there's always questions that come up related to that. Sometimes we don't remember from quarter to quarter or year to year what specific percentages mean. Um, and it's good sometimes to have refreshers on those. I have no, uh, I have no issues with budget versus actuals. Uh, on the personnel actions, those are fairly standard. Again, um, I have had a universal uh, complaint that I have voiced my entire time as a regent uh, that the granularity of that which has been suggested that is required by statute. I've asked again and again that that not be. Uh, uh, presented in the manner that it is, and that uh, I know that there are questions that go past that. Um, the FB three and four are two uh, bond refunds, so it's it's their bond issues. Uh, those are uh, we're going to probably I don't want to speak for the whole committee, but I'm going to vote to approve those uh, because. Uh, as I was told yesterday, that is merely a market-driven feature. So if the rates are favorable to doing that, it will happen. If they are not, it won't. There's no other agenda behind that other than the opportunity for a better uh, rate, market rate. So if that doesn't exist within the next 12 months, nothing will be done. And uh, that, that's that's behind that. So it's, it's not really changing anything unless the market conditions uh, provide that. Uh, FB5 is uh, Asset Preservation Capital Project. Uh, that's listed out uh, in some detail. We had some questions about some of the features of that um, and, and uh, got those answered. Um, sorry, you all. I lost my second page because I made a question on it. Um, okay, FB6. Uh, six year capital plan. Uh, there's some detail. FB6 was added since the initial agenda was um, presented to the public. Uh, I would suggest reading through it. It's sort of a, 
I hate to describe it this way, it's sort of a pie in the sky of renovation projects for the university. The board every few years will approve a capital plan and that will go to the CPE and then we'll also go uh, Council on Post-Secondary Education and, and then it will also be one of the talking points that they that our staff use in Frankfurt uh, when advocating for uh, either one-time money or additional uh, money related to that uh, the funding programs that list um, if you're looking at that list on projects capital projects I'm told that that is the ranked order um, I want to stress though that there may be a project on that list that you say wait a minute we're already doing that and it this could be an additional pie in the sky ask on on the same facility. Um, so there, uh, for instance, Cherry Hall is one of those where there's that some of that's already in progress. Um, there are no action items on the remaining committees, the Student Affairs Committee and uh, the Executive Committee. That's not uncommon for this time of year. Remember, we haven't approved a budget for the coming year. That'll happen as, as uh, was stated in early June. We'll have a special called meeting on that. Um, and I'm happy to have, you know, I'll entertain any questions that anybody has, uh, as always. And that's my report. Next, communication, Senator Vincent. Um, you're gonna discuss the election, right? Yeah, so no, no report. Uh, Treasurer Senator Purdy is not with us today. Uh, technology Senator Gilbert. Uh, uh, you've already mentioned the microphone upgrade, uh, but other than that, I'll report. Uh, next, uh, Senator Johnson. No report. And Vice Chair Senator Bashams. I'll let you do the uh, election stuff since you got to turn it out. I'll make a motion to approve. Uh, are you talking about this too? Um, I was going to mention that you were. Oh, no, 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 I'm leaving you on the good side. <laughs> uh, I will say we, we wrapped up our, our election round, so we should pretty well shortly. Uh, for, uh, for the Senate understands for what my motion will be later, um, our successful election still will leave us with five available seats. Um, the way we approached that last year was um, to have a special election, so I'll make that, that motion later. Um, all of the uh, Brian doesn't know this because the way our election work by chair administers that any any problems that come up, the chair stays out of it so that they can make a ruling. So he doesn't doesn't know exactly how it worked out. But um, all four of the positions um, that are to a two year term for the four candidates in that area, the other four candidates are in at large positions and they were spread out um, among EO you know, categories that are already filled with uh, senators that will continue. Uh, and I really plan to talk about that. So, yeah, probably. Probably. No, no, no. No, you go. No, I think it's better come from you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, that's all I got. Um, any questions? I'm happy to answer those later on for folks. Thank you. I've stolen a couple people's thunder today. <laughs> um, so, moving on to the chair report. One of the first things uh, I'll mention is um, out of the budget executive committee uh, at our last meeting, we received a memo back from executive leadership regarding um, recommendations that we had put forward. We had put forward a recommendation that a 2% faculty and staff salary increase pool uh, would exist in the next budget. And uh, that recommendation was accepted. So. Um, we would expect, as long as there are no unforeseen changes to that, um, the budget still needs to be approved and finalized. It's not official until it's voted on by the Board of Regents, um, but executive leadership did accept that recommendation that a 2% faculty and staff salary pool exists again, um, and then how that 2% will be distributed to faculty and staff will be determined by budget executive committee over the next several months. Um, so that will likely be a decision that again is one of the first things that VEC begins discussing in early fall. Um, so happy to announce that. Um, thanks. Um, next, the staff senate survey um, that did close on time, and as expected, uh, Dr. Kirchin Birch let me know that we should have results. Um, her and her students are doing the analysis on. Um, all of the submissions that were received. And so we should have analysis for that hopefully by the end of April. 
that we can share with leadership. And as Andrea mentioned, that's something that even HR will look forward to um, in terms of initiatives that they may want to engage in over the next year. Um, another um, would be the um, Staff Excellence Awards. Andrea touched on that as well, uh, but just going ahead and again, um, congratulating the 2023 Staff Excellence Award winners. That was Jenny Hensley, Brandy Fowler, Melissa Flowers, um, Debbie Gabbard, Gary Chandler, and then Brad Hornell. So again, congratulations to them um, and thank you for their service to WKU. Um, moving on to the election results. Um, so Jordan was kind enough to uh, pass on the election results to me. This will be sent out to um, staff all later today, um, but happy to announce the results here. Uh, so in the full-time executive admin professional uh, category, the representatives that will be elected to a two-year term based on the results um, is Jason Kanzler, Alex Collins, Tanya Vincent, and Taylor Wright. And then in the at-large representatives who will be elected to a one-year term, James Daniels, Rhonda Jones, Morgan Moran, and Tish Robertson. So congratulations to those uh, newly elected senators, some that are going to continue on and already serving as senators, but re-elected. Um, congratulations to all of them. And that is all that I have for my chair report. Any old business before the Senate? There was none on our agenda. And moving on to new business. Uh, to follow up, we'll have, uh, as it stands, we'll have five uh, vacancies on the Senate. That would set us at 15 senators. Um, our our uh, Constitution bylaws call out for a minimum of 20. Um, it gives us the option to does give us the option to leave the seats unfilled um, when there aren't enough candidates in an election or to hold a special election. Um, I'd like to make a motion that the Senate stands up a special election um, to fill uh, those five at-large, what would be at-large um, Senate seats uh, to serve in FY24. Second. Thank you. There's been a motion and a second. So um, now this is debatable and amendable. Yeah. And so, um, the floor is open for discussion. Uh, I'd like to add details that um, we'll work with IP on scheduling a date um, of when a, uh, an election could, could occur on TopNet. Uh, the, the current goal would be to try to finish it, uh, have stand the election up and have election date inside of the current semester, um, just to hopefully balance out uh, everybody's summer vacation schedules and not worry about uh, a date after, um, after commencement. Uh, but that, that date is yet to be confirmed, but that's the hope. Any other comment or questions? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to a vote on the motion. So of course, I'll hold a special election to fill the five remaining seats um, that are vacant. All of, I'd like to approve by unanimous consent. Are there any objections? <laughs> hearing none, we will um, consider that to be approved. So staff Senate will hold a special election to fill the five vacant seats after our most recent elections. And um, that date will be announced once it's determined. Any other new business before staff Senate? Um, any public comments? All right. Um, in the announcement section of our agenda, um, just as we always do, announce the staff to executive committee meeting will be next week, April 18th at 10 a.m. via Zoom. And then our next staff Senate meeting will be May 3rd at 10 a.m. here in the same room, DSU 2081. And our guest speaker for that meeting will be the, our director of internal audit, Bruce Weissman. Uh, so look forward to having him uh, with us and speak to tell us more about that internal auditor role here at WKU. And thank you for Tanya Vincent uh, for reaching out to him and getting that lined out for us. So. With that, 